students as decontextualized learners premised on the idea that a university is a meritocracy. Against this background, Professors Bowie and McKenna focus on how the nature of curricula and the agency of academics as teachers, researchers, and managers have endorsed specific kinds of knowing and knowledge making over others. The book looks at how higher education policies emerged from the notion of the knowledge economy in the new democratic South Africa and how national qualification frameworks and other processes brought the country more closely into conversation with the global order. It argues for alternative ways of seeing higher education that can inform practice and policy in South Africa and beyond. The book has been critically acclaimed by several role players, including those in higher education around the world. One reviewer describes the book as an outstanding book, offering an exceptionally rich analysis of the impacts of neoliberalism on higher education in South Africa. It examines a vi in vibrant detail the ways through which a market ideology has penetrated the education system with devastating costs on faculty, students, and research. Another describes the book as a timely, insightful, and nuanced rendition of alternative perspectives on higher education. There's an end there. It has also been described as a compelling read for everyone involved in academia, as a powerful and inspiring book, and a truly insightful, engaging, and informative read. Every vice chancellor, academic and ordinary citizen must read this book. This book award has achieved two significant milestones. It is, the, it is the first time that the book award has been awarded outside of the humanities faculty. The Center for Postgraduate Studies is not aligned with any particular faculty, but both authors have come up through the education faculty. It is for the first time that a winning title in the Vice Chancellor's Book Award has been entirely open access. Readers can now download the full digital version for free, although paper copies are also available. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to hand over to Professors Bowie and McKenna, who will share with us their journey in writing this incredibly insightful book. Thank you. Yes, we're not going to tell you what's in the book. We're going to tell you, first of all, why we wrote the book and then how we wrote the book. Um, I'm going to begin and then I'm going to hang, hand over to Sue. But don't be surprised if we interrupt each other because we, we've been working together and thinking together for so long that that tends to happen. So anyway, let's begin with um, why we wrote the book. And going back to the 1990s, when the concept of institutional transformation, the, the idea that the universities themselves would change, would need to change, uh, was central to the role seen for higher education in, in the creation of a new democracy. So institutional change was a really, really important idea. 
And our, origin, our origins lie in the field of academic development, a sort of stepchild of academic life, um, began in the 1980s, supposedly to help poor black students in, in the universities who were struggling and so on and so on. It wasn't really recognized as an academic field. It was those people who help. Um, but nonetheless, the thinking that went on, particularly towards the end of the 1980s, that repositioned the field so that it, it, it saw a, certainly a role for itself in institutional development. So I, I can speak for myself. I, I, in those days, I was at um, University of the Western Cape which had been at the forefront of ideas about a new higher education system. And um, I was very excited about the potential that academic development, my field, could have a role to play in that. And I think Sue felt the same. Different place, but that was the sort of order of things. Hope for the future. So things started out really well. Um, I think a really important document to this day, and we need to keep going back to look at it, is the 1997 white paper. And particularly, it's paragraph 1.3, right at the beginning. It identifies four purposes of higher education. And, and the first is to meet the learning needs and aspirations of individuals what people want to learn, what they want to do in, in relation to their inter intellectual endeavor. The second purpose, to contribute to the development of a critical citizenry, really important in a new democracy, and higher education had a role in doing that. The next purpose we're all familiar with, to produce and disseminate knowledge. And then finally, to contribute to the development of a skilled workforce. So the, the, the global order, the knowledge economy, the universities were seen as places that could produce these knowledge workers, these highly skilled workers, and go out and, and help South Africa thrive economically. Those four purposes, really well-rounded purposes, and, and whenever I go back to look at those, I, I still think, wow, Yes, that's what higher education is about. But over time, last purpose, purpose D, has become dominant to the extent that the other purposes are now mostly overlooked. No matter, it's not only in South Africa, it's across the world. It, it's the idea that universities exist to produce these workers for the global economy. Um, we both think that's problematic. We, we think the role of the university in society, in, in a, a nation, is much wider than that, and that we can't lose those four purposes. But we, we were concerned at the way one purpose was, was really becoming very dominant. So the question is, why? Why did that happen? I mean, most of our students on campus, if you talk to them, talk to them about why you're here, it'll, it'll be about getting a job. And often they're studying things that they don't really like, but they see the things that they're studying as enabling a better job, a, mo a more um, prestigious form of employment in the future. And yet they don't often like those things. I've met students studying accounting who, probably would have been better doing music or fine art. And we're often very unhappy because of the choices that in a way they'd been pushed into um, because of this idea that university is about getting a job. So why, why has it happened? Well, you have to take it back to neoliberalism and the idea that it's about the logic of the market. So higher education now is constructed following the logic of the market. So just the way you might choose, do I, do I go and buy a Steers burger or do I go and have Kentucky Fried Chicken? It's like that. Do I go to this university or do I go to that university? It, it's about a university having a market value, a market brand. And in that logic of the market, knowledge itself becomes a commodity 
to be bought and sold. So th the idea that knowledge itself has value, economic value, not value for the good of society, not, not value for the good of humankind, but that it might have economic value then is privileged. And in this process, higher education becomes about the individual. It, it becomes a private good. It, it's something that will benefit me, the individual, because once I have the degree, and once I have the degree from this particular university as opposed to that university, I'll be able to go out into the workplace and get a better job, earn more money, and therefore have access to all those things I've long dreamed of. So it, it becomes about the individual rather than my education as a contribution to society more widely. And of course, what that also does, the idea that education is a private good, is it provides the logic for a reduction in state funding. So if, if a higher education benefits an individual, not society, why should the state pay for it? Let the individual pay for it because they're going to benefit. So this allows the state to reduce the subsidy. And indeed, that has happened in South Africa. Per capita income um, funding of students has fallen. And, and then you get the increase in tuition fees where students are expected to bear more and more of the cost of their education. And of course, we know all about that from the protests 2015 and 2016. The other thing that's um, come in to higher education is this idea of new public management. Um, some people might term it managerialism. So go back to the 1980s, Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, the idea that um, higher education and teaching and learning our field as one of its core functions should draw on the principles of so-called good management, the same principles that inform business and industry. So it, it, it brings in the way of understanding a university, managing a university that is drawn from business. So the vice chancellor isn't the head of the university, the leader who in traditional forms of academic governance needs to lead academic staff and the students and the whole staff, the support staff as well. But, but to do that literally through leadership, not through management, to, to, to win their hearts and minds. And that the traditionally the vice chancellors in, in the traditional forms of academic governance didn't hold executive powers. The powers lay in the faculties because the faculties awarded the qualifications. The faculties were the guardians of knowledge. And, and so what the vice chancellor had to do was literally win hearts and minds. But once you get this idea that you, you draw on the principles of business, business and industry, those forms of academic governance are challenged. And you get the idea of the... Um, the vice chancellor as a CEO with a brand, the university as a brand. I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago and the, the vice chancellor there talked about the brand and strengthening the brand. So you see that coming in from industry. The other thing you get, and this is something we both felt very strongly about, is the metrification of human endeavor intellectual endeavor. Um, students become subsidy units. They're not people, they're units. And, and we will do what we do in teaching and learning because what we, what we want to do is to increase the number of units that the university can earn. And knowledge becomes research outputs. It's not knowledge for the value of knowledge, for the sake of what it can and contribute to our way of understanding the world around us and society. It's an output. It can earn money, either through patents or whatever, but in the South African system, it earns subsidy. So the human slides away 
and, and what you get is this process of metrification. And we've seen that particularly in our own field, academic development, where teaching and learning um, from the early 2000s onwards was increasingly seen as a way of supporting universities to become more efficient in, in relation to the number of outputs, teaching outputs they, they could produce. The other thing that happens then is you get lots of reporting on goals, targets, objective, objectives, and this impacts on the time available for other activities, for thinking, for writing, for teaching, for talking to students and so on. And as I've already said, all this is about universities constructing themselves as brands in a competitive market. And you get the ranking systems coming in then, and, and it's about winning an edge in that competitive market. So that started to come in. And the other thing that that's came in and which started to concern us was this idea of meritocracy. Meritocracy has always been there, but it is particularly strong. And I'll try and, and explain why you have to have merit, meritocracy um, to, to support the whole neoliberalism and, and um, new public management. So if higher education is understood as a means of gaining access to the goods of the world, literally the goods of the world, because a qualification will bring you access to higher status, higher, higher income, employment, and so on. Therefore, a car, a house, da, 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 da. If higher education is understood in this way, then access and success have to be understood as open to everybody. Anybody can have those goods. But... What you then have to do is to say that the ability to get the goods is dependent on characteristics of the individual. So uh, a student who is intelligent, who has the right aptitude, um, who has the right motivation, that student will succeed and therefore that student will get access to the goods of the world. So what, what you can then see, at least in our thinking, is that students become constructed as decontextualized learners. It's like it's open to everybody. And, and it, it, this idea of meritocracy, it, it forgets that universities, and we could talk about this and bore you to death, but universities do address themselves to particular social groups. And universities contribute to the reproduction of society, no matter how much we talk about transformation. So this, this idea of a higher education being open to everybody, providing the student has the right characteristics, that really bothered us. And it was something that we wanted to challenge in the book. So what you then get is the, the institution of the university, it's exonerated from privileging some over others. And as Sue will talk about our, our research, we could see that very, very clearly in the data we had, that universities privilege some people over others. And you, you've got to, it's not even very hard to look at the data to see how that's working out. And I'm sure Sue will talk about it. So, Basically, as, as all this was coming in and, and we were reading and writing and whatever, our engagement with critical pedagogy and critical social theory led us to understand teaching and learning, not as neutral, but as profoundly social, cultural and political. Political. It's, it's not just about being a good teacher and, you know, disseminating knowledge, winning your students. It's, it's a social, cultural, and a political act. And we also came to understand the curriculum, not just as the what, the list of topics or whatever, or even in a broader way, the curriculum as the what and the how of teaching and addressing 
this particular kind of students with these needs. No, we, we came to understand the curriculum as a device that regulates access to what can count as knowledge and how that knowledge can be known. And we also saw reading and writing not as neutral skills, therefore open to everybody, but rather as sets of social practices that the kinds of reading and writing that we do in the university are things that people do that are characteristic of particular social groups. And they, they've then become privileged and neutralized, if you like, but they're not. They're the social practices of some particular groups. And so people who haven't been born and socialized into those particular ways of reading and writing, they're excluded. So we started to understand all this over many, many years. And is this, that's, that's you? No, that's you. So I'm now going to hand over to Sue. And she hasn't interrupted. So, um, as Chrissy said, field of academic development. Definitely, we started out with a very um, problematic remedial agenda. That's what the field did. It was to try and make sure that people could fit into the system so the system didn't need to change. Over the years, as Chrissy pointed out, the efficiency agenda meant that uh, the importance of academic development shifted somewhat from making students fit in to making students complete in regulation time. And these were the kinds of things that we're saying, hang on, but what's a university for? And surely there are more social ways of understanding students. And a lot of this came, we were very much complicit. I wanna make that very clear. We were part of the system as we all are and as we continue to be. But with engagement with critical um, pedagogy literature, we started to come to this understanding that actually, Universities are deeply political. A universe, the university system serves to reproduce social inequalities in many devastating ways. And so we really need to look to ourselves and how our work might actually be simply replicating rather than um, upsetting. And um, so what we did and what the book originally was based on was on some work that Chrissy was originally commissioned to do for the Council on Higher Education. The whole system had been through a massive set of audits. And so there was a huge amount of data on every public university in South Africa, how they evaluated themselves, how panels evaluated them, how they said they were going to improve. And Chrissy was commissioned to look into this data to see, well, what's going on with teaching and learning? And then she brought me on board. And our research, our, our research on this first cycle of quality audits showed us very clearly that what had happened through this big, massive, multi-million rand process of um, audits was that the university system in South Africa had introduced a whole lot of physical structures that hadn't existed beforehand. Suddenly, we had policies on almost everything. And um, we had teaching and learning centers. We often had deans of teaching and learning. These were new posts, new people, new centers. Um, and of course, quality assurance centers and so on. There's also, as I said, the um, appointment of key agents within these centers. But what we found in this data was that although the audits had brought about a flurry of activity, they hadn't necessarily enabled the universities to critically reflect on what is a university education for, who are our students, what knowledge is included, what knowledge is excluded, who is privileged, who is alienated. It didn't, it didn't um, do that. So as a result, the audits, we said, had actually very little ability to attend to what really mattered, even though it had taken many, 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 many hours and forests loads of, of paper and so on. Um, it had very little opportunity to actually bring about institutional change and to act, actually bring about equitable student success. So we wanted to raise concerns about how universities were insufficiently considering students as social beings. In other words, as people who have a swathe of life experiences, knowledges, norms, values, dispositions, ways of being. Um, and 
we felt that even with the rise of terminology like student centeredness and so on, that that wasn't actually the dominant understanding. And as Chrissy said, it didn't take um, incredibly expert discourse analysis on our part for us to see this in the documentation. And we also saw how quality assurance, which really only emerged at this stage in South Africa, but how it was increasingly being constructed as being about policies and structures. It wasn't about making spaces for reflection on the purposes of higher education. And so what it rapidly became was about bureaucratic compliance. And we often had to have additional staff members to do the bureaucracy um, so that the rest of us could presumably do our jobs. Um, so, so we wanted to write to understand all of this. And that in the book, we tried to unpack the theory we used in a way that we thought would be useful for actually people doing educational research. So we tried to, you know, use our supervisor hats. Um, so we tried to do that. And so in a way, that's what I'm extending now. And I say that we wrote to understand a lot of, a lot of this book was written in scribbled conversations, jotting down notes to figure out what we thought. Rieta, you just said that to me in a supervision session an hour ago, right? writing this stuff down to figure out what I think about it. And so I think that's really important, that it's not like we had a very clear plan. We had a discomfort. We'd done a whole lot of reporting to the CHE, and then we just started scribbling, and we, whenever we could, and this went over years, and we literally rewrote the book from beginning to end three times with quite different agendas and readers and in mind until we settled on the final version. And so we needed, we needed a publisher. So... I think probably on draft number two of the book, um, we thought, well, we'll go back to the CHE because the CHE who'd commissioned Chrissy and then me as well to do the original work had said that they'd be very keen for us to actually publish from it. So we had the right to publish from this data. And so we went back to the CHE. There had been a change of actors. So we were now dealing with different people. And we said, well, you know, we've got this book. We looked at the data. We really think that there's something important about the way in which we're understanding um, students, the way in which we're understanding higher education, and our lack of understanding about how these global forces play out in everyday practices of academics and, and all others within the university. But suddenly the, the CHE said, oh, I don't know about that. They weren't for, no, thank you. Um, I, I don't think we want to go forward with this book. I mean, as you saw from the previous slide, I mean, we were spending a lot of time saying that most of the money and time and energy spent on QA was a little bit problematic. So perhaps it's not surprising. Um, but I also think it's important to note that at that stage, draft two was before fees must fall protests. And I think that the fees must fall protests have forced people to have these conversations in a way that, I just don't think they were as readily on the table. So I think they've been like, <laughs> they've been put on the table far more explicitly. Um, and then, so we thought, okay, well now we're gonna have to find some other publisher. And we've both published or edited book chapters or edited books or whatever in books, you know, Rutledge costs two, a book I've got a chapter in 2,300 Rand for a little book this big. Um, I mean, if anyone ever wants to read it, I've got the PDF, give me a shout. Um, so we just thought this is, this is a bit of a scam, the whole academic publishing industry. Um, it, it really is a case, especially in terms of the global north dominating knowledge production and the global south not having easy access. Our university spends millions of rands to have access to journal articles, but most universities on this continent don't. And you wonder why there's so many references to texts that are the abstract, to the abstract of text. It's not necessarily because people are too lazy to read the whole article, it's because they that's all they have access to. And so we just sort of, we had a, a real debate and I'm not pointing fingers here at anyone who publishes with, you know, these very expensive uh, um, books, but um, we continue to publish amongst them. But certainly we just had a sense that there's, there's something really broken in the academic publishing system. Very similar, and there's a number of people who've spoken about the, the flows of money in the academic publish, publication economy. Very similar to take the golden diamonds here, cheap labor, miners, send it across, polish it up, sell it for a huge, very similar, collect the data. And there's a number of people who've tracked those processes of academic publishing. Um, and so you're sitting on the um, top 10 publishing houses publish 
something like close to 60% of all academic publishers. Um, and their profit margins are, and I never know exactly what a billion is, but their profit margins are between seven and 10,000 million. So I don't know what, when that becomes. Oh, so we went, we went to El Sofia once when we were in the Netherlands, we were invited to go to El Sofia. So it was like stepping into the Dragon's Den, beautiful building. I mean, El Sofia, as you may know, the CEO of El Sofia is the most highly paid, highly paid CEO in Europe. What does he make money from? Your labor. Um, and we went in there and we went and they gave us a lovely talk telling us all the stats, and impact factors and so on, and why South Africa wasn't faring very well. And the conclusion that they reached, that they gave us some good advice, you need to publish with people in the global north, because if you have global north co-authors, then you will probably get more cited. So that was the good advice they gave us. Um, so they, they were all these, there were all these concerns. And as I say, it's not like we've taken the moral high ground, we will only publish open access again. But it was certainly something that we felt strongly about. Um, but there are still real concerns. And I feel like this is something for our university to have a conversation around is, you know, these considerations. And I hear this loosely said, I was at an editor's meeting at Springer week before last, and I hear these comments about how, well, you know, um, journals that aren't indexed are really bad quality. And of course, these things are all clouded with issues around predatory publications and so on. But I think there's important conversations to be had. And perhaps for junior academics, it's too risky to be having these conversations and to back the trend. But perhaps for, for more senior academics, we should be the ones who, who do say, hang on, we need to make information available to everyone. Um, so we went for the free version. Go for it. You can download the book for free. Um, and even the hard copy. African Minds was absolutely wonderful to work with. Um, and they have been very good at making sure that the book is available for free online. So that's immediately been interesting to us. Who's reading the book? Who's downloading it? Who's citing it? But certainly um, we're picking up citations across Africa. My, my um, journal articles get cited in South Africa, Australia, the UK, they don't get cited in Kenya and Rwanda and so on. So there's something important here that I think was a byproduct of this book writing process that I, I really would urge us as an institution to, to think through. And I know it's made complex by the way in which the subsidy works. And so we need to be clever and I understand we are working within this context, but I think there's some space for us to really challenge some of the knowledge flows that happen between the North and the South. And I think I've come to the last slide. Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> I would like to thank Professor Bowie and Professor McKenna for a very inspiring lecture. I am almost tempted to allow two or three questions. Would that be in order? I haven't seen it previously done, but hey. <laughs> okay, any burning questions? I had some sitting down there. You know, what, what's long enough? All right, in that case then, Ah. Yeah, um, I think it's Leonard Cohen with the cracks that let the lights in, that let the light in. I think you found the cracks in the system, you open conversations. I mean, I can give you one small little example. It's a really minor example, but it's just the one that sprung to my mind as you were talking, is when you fill in your NRF rating, 
when you fill in your NRF rating form. Um, they, one of the things that, that there's, there's pressure to do is you've got to put in your uh, Scopus H index, your um, uh, Google Scholar H index, so on. And then there's a, a real pressure, I think, to speak to sole authored publications, okay? Um, and in fact, I've had colleagues who've got feedback saying you don't have enough sole authored publications. But we can there is space in the narrative of that to talk to why, and I'm not saying this is appropriate for all fields, it's very different in different fields, but why humanities and social sciences often a pressure to get the sole authored. Why do you want to publish with colleagues, with students? Um, so there are, I mean, that sounds like a silly way. I think there are bigger conversations to be had. There are very serious activists in this field. Um, some of whom have paid significant price. Aaron Schwartz committed suicide after he downloaded all the, uh, you know, he ran before before we had, um, what's her name that runs the current illegal online uh, access to knowledge. Um, Orange Swartz came before her, before Rebecca, and um, Orange Swartz uh, downloaded, I think it was the whole of Sage and said, this knowledge should be available to everyone. This is nonsense. Anyway, he had so many lawsuits and what have you, and his life was made in absolute misery. Um, so there are big actors who do big things, but I think there's also small, there's small things we can do. I mean, a tiny thing that we did as well in this book is that you'll note that, I mean, since then we've had lots of other PhD students, but one of the things we did was that we sat at every single one of our PhD students. So I think there's like 40, 50 PhD students sat at in the book. Um, and that was because, you know, we want to say, you know, we know some fun people doing fun work in this stuff, in this area. So I think the, the cracks that lit the Latin. Can I just say something about teaching and learning? And if you could do anything, wherever you are as a teacher and you stand in front of a class of students, if you could just think, what I'm doing isn't normal for everybody. What, what I'm doing is strange for many of the people in this room, probably for most of the people in the room. And, and the fact that they're not doing what I want them to do isn't for want of trying or isn't for, for want of all the things that, you know, the meritocratic arguments cite, like intelligence, motivation, aptitude. It's because it's strange. And so how, how, can, how can you, as a teacher, make the normal strange for you, so you can start to try to explain it to students. And then that leads you into all sorts of other um, ideas about, well, are there other ways of doing it? Do I, do I have to follow the normal? But if I could just say that about teaching and learning, I think that's a big thing. Thank you very much. And now I would like on behalf of the university to offer a small token of appreciation from the university for you having given this lecture. Thank you very much. Okay. And now I'd like to thank all of you, ladies and gentlemen, um, and those uh, online for having joined us this evening. And further, I would like to invite you to enjoy some refreshments on the concourse and to continue enjoying the evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>